Government officials in charge of preparing for and responding to the flu outbreak testified before a House Energy and Commerce subcommittee. They talked about efforts to create a universal vaccine, assessing the effectiveness of vaccines, and dispelling myths about vaccination. This is an hour and 40 minutes. Good morning. This year, like so many previous years, we've had uh, a bad flu season. After months of record-breaking widespread flu activity, the CDC has reported that the flu season has finally peaked. We're probably still going to see flu activity until the middle of April. So if you have the flu or flu uh, uh, symptoms, it certainly is important to see your doctor and, and stay at home. Influenza is a leading cause of death in the United States, especially in a severe flu season. Every year, thousands of Americans die from the flu and thousands more are hospitalized from flu-related complications. Since 2010, the flu has caused between 12,000 and 56,000 deaths per year. But this year was no exception. Tragically, as of February the 24th, there have been already been 114 influenza-associated pediatric deaths this season. Some of those deaths have occurred in my home state of Mississippi. Although we've enhanced our preparedness for the flu in recent years, there's still room for improvement. The best way to prevent the flu is by getting your flu shot. Millions of Americans receive a flu shot every year to help protect them against this illness. Unfortunately, there are many Americans that do not do that. Last year, only 59% of children and about 43% of adults received flu vaccination. Even though only a little over half of Americans typically get vaccinated, CDC estimates that flu vaccination prevented 3,000 pneumonia and influenza deaths during the 2015-2016 flu season alone. Increasing the number of Americans that get the annual flu vaccine will prevent more deaths and illnesses. Not only can the flu vaccine help prevent an individual from getting the flu, but it also helps reduce uh, severe outcomes when someone does get sick with the flu. During past seasons, about 80% of flu-associated deaths in children have occurred in children who were not vaccinated. Similarly, a recent study found that receiving the flu vaccine reduced severe outcomes in hospitalized patients by reducing deaths, reducing ICU admissions, reducing ICU lengths of stays, and reducing overall length of stay for hospital patients. While the flu vaccine is currently the best tool to prevent illness, there is room for improvement. The CDC recently announced that this year's flu vaccine was only about 36% effective in preventing an individual from getting the flu. The vaccine's effectiveness varied from different age groups and for different strains of the virus. For example, the vaccine was 59% effective in children. However, it was much less effective in adults. For all age groups, the vaccine was only 25% effective this season against the deadliest strain of the flu, H3N2. The vaccine's reduced effectiveness against H3N2, the most uh, virulent and predominant strain of the flu this season, is, is especially concerning. Historically, we have struggled to make an effective vaccine against H3N2. For example, during the 2014-2015 flu season, this committee closely examined the flu vaccine's reduced effectiveness due to the mismatch between the H3N2 strain used to develop the vaccine and the H3N2 a strain that was actually circulating. During the 2014-2015 season, the flu vaccine was only 9% effective because the H3N2 virus had mutated before the flu season began. This experience reminding us, reminded us of the importance of being able to rapidly detect and respond to changes in the challenging and circulating flu viruses. According to the FDA, this year, the vaccine's reduced effectiveness against the H3N2 virus was not caused by a mismatch. One factor that may explain why the flu vaccine was not that effective against the H3N2 strain is a mutation caused by the vaccine and egg, ag egg adaptation through the egg-based manufacturing process. 
Currently, about 80 to 85 percent of the flu vaccines are manufactured through the egg-based manufacturing process. When an activated or an inactivated flu virus is grown in chicken eggs during the vaccine manufacturing process, genetic changes can occur in the virus that make the vaccine less effective in humans. Some researchers think that egg adaptation might be especially problematic for the H3N2 virus. Of course, there are many different factors that also might explain the flu vaccine's reduced effectiveness for H3N2. This issue needs to be thoroughly investigated so we can improve the vaccine manufacturing process if necessary and improve the vaccine's effectiveness in the future. I appreciate the hard work and dedication of the people at HHS to improve our flu preparedness, including those at CDC, NIH, ASPR, and FDA. One of our top priorities is to keep Americans healthy during flu season and improve the federal public health response. And I look forward to today's testimony. The chair will now recognize Ranking Member Ms. Gett for purposes of an opening statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm always happy to have this flu hearing, which we seem to do every year. Uh, looking at the witnesses, I feel like we're getting the band back together again to talk once again about what we can do. I appreciate you all coming, and I'm hoping that uh, this year we can actually make some progress in talking about all of these issues that the chairman mentioned. Um, we had, we, we've had in this subcommittee seven hearings on flu preparedness since 2004. Most recently in 2015, we had two hearings after the country was hit with a particularly severe uh, 2014 and 15 flu season in which the H3N2 strain of flu predominated. This year again, we're experiencing a severe flu season caused by the H3N2. Um, and that's really a stark reminder of how the flu is very, very serious. Hospitalizations have been high throughout the country. 114 children have died. As an example, my home state of Colorado set two records, not good records this year, with nearly 4,000 4, people hospitalized due to flu and 160 flu outbreaks in long-term care facilities. Um, as the chairman mentioned, this year's flu vaccine was only 36% effective, and, um, and that's of concern. Even I had the flu, and I had my vaccine too. And so, um, so you know, this, this really is something that one would think in the year 2018 we would be able to tackle in a more meaningful way. Um, I understand that the FDA's flu vaccine or the vaccine advisory committee met, j just met to make recommendations for next year's vaccine. I'm looking forward to hearing from the FDA uh, about how data on this year's vaccine effectiveness helped to inform the decision making for next year. I'm also hoping, as usual, to hear about more about research efforts to, dis to, to pr produce a more broadly protective vaccine or even a universal vaccine that can target all strains of flu. And Mr. Chairman, we've talked in, in these various hearings over the years about the egg-based vaccines. And, and the, egg back, the, the mutation of the virus with, within the egg is only one of the problem with egg-based va vaccines. When you look at the uh, more remote but yet very real threat of a pandemic flu, if you're relying on egg-based vaccines, you can't be very nimble in producing, um, in, in producing vaccines in, a, in an effective and, and fast way. Um, and so I, I think that uh, this year, if it's any good news, a silver lining about the um, ravages of this flu season, maybe it will make the public understand how important this issue is for our uh, public health agencies to address. And I know all of our witnesses will remind us even a vaccine with a low effectiveness rate will still protect millions from getting sick or may help mitigate the symptoms when people do get sick. And so until we fix this system in a broader way, the flu vaccine is still our best tool. But unfortunately, the number of Americans who got a flu shot this year has not changed from our last hearing in 2015. I'm hoping that that's another thing we can discuss about how we can persuade people to get the vaccine and concrete steps that perhaps we can take next year. As I said, 
We also have to work towards better treatment methods, in particular more effective antiviral medications so that people who do become sick can be cared for before their illness becomes more serious. And I understand there are some of these medications in the pipeline right now. Maybe um, some of our witnesses can talk about these drugs that are in the pipeline. And also maybe they can talk about some of the spot shortages we saw this past season. Um, finally, the importance of a strong public health infrastructure cannot be overstated. Because of the critical work of federal and state public health experts, we are always in a good position, but there's still more that needs to be done. And I'm looking forward to hearing how we can coordinate our strategies across all levels of government. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I, again, I want to thank the witnesses who are here today, some of which I've worked with for years. They are true public servants and truly dedicated to tackling this issue. And I know they will be our partners in this committee as we continue to go forward. Thanks, and I yield back. Oh, also, I'd ask unanimous consent to put Mr. Pallone's opening statement in the record. He will not be able to come today. Without objection. A uh, gentlewoman yields back. Chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Walden, for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. I thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, in the, this has been, I think, one of the most severe flu seasons in the United States uh, that we've seen. Uh, nearly 50,000 people die in a single season. Um, today, we're currently experiencing a, a severe flu season with a predominantly deadly strain, by all accounts. Um, it's vital to find ways to reduce deaths and hospitalizations from this challenging and changing virus. At Energy and Commerce, and this subcommittee in particular, we have a long history, as you've heard, of conducting these oversight hearings and trying to be as helpful we can to you all as we work on the public policy. During our last hearing in November of 2015, we explored many important issues, including how the Department of Health and Human Services could help improve our ability to respond to seasonal flu vaccine mismatches. More than 70 years, most flu vaccines have been made through an egg-based process. And over the last decade, we've seen some innovation in the manufacturing of the annual flu vaccine. The FDA approved the first flu vaccine manufactured using cell culture technology in 2012. And the FDA approved the first flu vaccine manufactured using uh, recombinant DNA technology in 2013. In addition, in addition to new manufacturing technologies and methodologies, we've also seen new types of flu vaccine made available for uh, the American people. Historically, flu vaccines, I understand, have been offered to uh, protect against three different strains of flu virus. And in 2012, uh, the FDA approved the first flu vaccine that offered protection against four different strains. Uh, in 2009, the FDA approved the first high-dose flu vaccine for older adults. And some data show that the high-dose flu vaccine is more effective in older individuals than the normal dose. Now that we have different ways to manufacture the flu vaccine, we need to ensure we have enough data and information to make sure we're making the most effective uh, seasonal flu vaccine possible. The FDA recently announced that preliminary data show that the cell-based flu vaccine might be somewhat more effective, I understand, in preventing the flu than the egg-based vaccine this season. We need to understand why that might be and uh, why there are differences in effectiveness so we can improve vaccine manufacturing processes as necessary. As subcommittee chairman Harper has said and, and emphasized, uh, the annual flu vaccine is still the best uh, defense. Every year, thousands of lives are saved because people uh, get that vaccine. Um, and so if you do get the flu, there are antivirals, as we all know, and we've heard, uh, I, don't I can't remember a flu season where more people I know have said, oh yeah, I got Tamiflu, or somebody I know got Tamiflu, or whatever the, uh, the antivirals are. And so that's an important part of this as well, and I'd love for you to talk a bit about uh, what has been in the press about the, the Japanese uh, product, apparently in Japan, that might cut off the flu even sooner, and, and where, what do you see on, on that one, if anything? And, and one day we hope to have a universal vaccine. We're encouraged by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases recent release of a strategic plan for developing a universal flu vaccine. I'm also glad uh, we have all of you here today and the director of the Biomedical Advances Research and Development Authority here to share the information uh, that you all are working on. So thank you. And with that, I yield the remainder of my time uh, to the chairman of the Health Subcommittee, the good doctor from Texas, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank our witnesses for taking the time to testify before us today. Most of you are well known to this uh, subcommittee. The flu has hit many of our districts with astonishing force this year. 
The district that I represent in North Texas, we, our public health departments were strained. We had schools that had to close temporarily to prevent the spread of flu amongst children. Since the start of this flu season, more than 400 people in my area have been hospitalized as a result of the flu. 12 reported influenza-associated deaths, including one pediatric death. Earlier this year, the health subcommittee was briefed by Dr. Fauci and uh, someone from the CDC about the development and effectiveness of this year's flu vaccine. The timing of this particular hearing is appropriate, given that we are just past the peak of flu season. And now people are working on the development of next year's vaccine, and we're all anxious to hear what awaits for next year. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this important and timely hearing, and I certainly look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I ask unanimous consent that the members' written opening statements be made part of the record without objection will be entered into the record. Additionally, I ask unanimous consent that Energy and Commerce members not on the subcommittee on oversight and investigations be permitted to participate in today's hearing without objection so ordered. I'd now like to introduce our witnesses on to, for today's uh, hearing. Uh, first today, we have Dr. Ann Shukit, the Acting Director for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We welcome you today. Uh, second, we have Dr. Anthony uh, Fauci, the Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. Then we have Dr. Rick Bright, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response and Director of the Medical Advances Research and Development Authority at the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, which means there's no way that gets on a business card. But uh, we're glad to have you here. Uh, and finally, the Honorable Scott uh, Gottlieb, who serves as the Commissioner for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. I want to thank you uh, each for being here. This is a very important topic, and we look forward to having this uh, discussion uh, today. Uh, are you each aware that the committee is holding an investigative hearing, and when so doing, we have the practice of taking testimony under oath? Does anyone have an objection to testifying under oath? Seeing none. Uh, the chair then advises you that under the rules of the House and the rules of the committee, you're entitled to be accompanied by counsel. Do any of you uh, desire to be accompanied by counsel for the purposes of today's hearing? Seeing none, uh, in that case, if you would please rise, and raise your right hand, and I will swear you in. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You may be seated. You are now under oath and subject to the penalty set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code, uh, and you may now each give a five-minute summary, summary of your written statement, and uh, we will begin first uh, with Dr. Shukit, and you are now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Influenza is a formidable adversary. The virus is ever-changing. It's with us every year, and it's too often able to outsmart our immune systems. At CDC, we've worked with domestic and global partners to build cutting edge systems to characterize influenza viruses and the disease they cause, and to monitor vaccine effectiveness. We know that people are concerned about this flu season, and that concern is warranted. Influenza can be a very serious threat to the health of Americans, and despite the progress we've made, we have much more work to do. I'll provide brief updates about this season and the work that CDC is doing to improve the tools for influenza prevention and control. As you've heard, this has been a severe season. Hospitalizations have broken records. Influenza-like illness presenting to doctor's offices and emergency departments at its peak was about as high as we saw during the pandemic of 2009. Too many children have died already from influenza this season. We had intense activity in virtually the whole country at the same time, and that contributed to some of the spot shortages of antivirals. We are not over with the season. Disease is decreasing, but the B strains are starting to uh, be as common as the H3N2 strains. As you've heard, the vaccine effectiveness this season was lower than usual. It was at 36% overall, and even lower for the H3N2 strains that dominated. Children did receive better protection from the flu vaccine. 
59% effectiveness in children and about 50% effectiveness against the H3 N2 strains. A reminder that vaccinating children can be life-saving against flu. Sadly, the vast majority of children who die from influenza have not received any vaccine at all. There are many theories about why influenza vaccines work less well against the H3N2 strains. One theory is that there are egg adapted changes that occur in the process of developing the vaccine. There may be differences in effectiveness based on prior immunization or prior exposure to flu strains. We're still characterizing the viruses for this year. We do not think there was antigenic drift, but there may be some changes in the viruses that could account for the severe season. That's still under study. Some vaccine is better than no vaccine protection. We wish the vaccines worked better, but we do know that the vaccines are providing protection to many and they're mitigating the severity of the disease. CDC has three objectives in our work with vaccine. We want to maximize use of the current vaccines. We want to support the NIH's leadership in developing a universal vaccine. And in the near term, we want to improve the current vaccines that we have. We have made significant progress since the 2009 pandemic. We have more data than ever before. We have more information on vaccine effectiveness from our multi-state network. We're producing more potential vaccine candidates. We're collecting more information on the genomic characteristics of the viruses using next generation sequencing. We are working with pharmacies, long-term care facilities, and insurers to address the spot shortages of antivirals, and we're able to smooth things out a bit during this season, but we know people were still frustrated. But despite the progress we've made, there is much more to learn about influenza, and we think that investing in that learning can have direct implications for prevention and control. In closing, I know this has been a difficult flu season and a heartbreaking one for too many families. Flu continues to be a priority for the CDC. We are literally working 24-7 on this issue. And we are all across HHS committed to working together to find ways and tools to help Americans reduce their risk of getting sick. So I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Chair will now recognize Dr. Fauci for five minutes for the purposes of his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Deget. Uh, Chairman Walden, members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about the role of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the NIH in addressing seasonal and pandemic influenza. Uh, does this work? No, it does. Who do I point it at? You? Doesn't work. So could you advance it, please? Uh, next slide. Um, as you can see that as I've testified before this committee multiple times that the NIH research, in this case in influenza, is multifaceted, involving basic research, uh, research resources, clinical research, ultimately with the development of countermeasures in the form of diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. For the purpose of today's discussion, I'll focus only on vaccines. If I could have the next slide. As seen in this slide, as mentioned before, and let me start off by reiterating what you said, what the, Mr. Getty said, and what Ann Shook had said, is that it is always better to get vaccinated than not to get vaccinated. But in that reality, we can do better with the vaccines that we have, because the current influenza vaccines are not consistently effective. We have an example of that this year. Also, pandemics occur, and our responses are generally not very effective. We've seen that with the 2009 pandemic flu, and we continue to chase after potential pandemics like H5N1, H7N9. Next slide. The major challenges in influenza vaccinology is we need to improve on the current influenza vaccines. We need to improve the production of these from egg-based to cell-based to recombinant DNA technology. And I'll get back to that in a moment. And also, we need to, as Ann mentioned, to develop universal influenza vaccines for broad coverage. Next slide. Egg-based technology is time-honored indeed. It has been effective, but it's antiquated. We need to graduate into the 21st century. Cell-based is better, but recombinant DNA technologies that I'll get into in a moment, which will be the tools to which we develop a universal flu vaccine, is the way of the future. Next slide. When you talk about improving seasonal influenza preparedness, 
that essentially marries you to the preparing for a pandemic. And I'll explain what I mean. Next slide. I wrote an article just recently when we got into the problem of the growing in eggs with the adaptation in eggs leading to a less effective vaccine to emphasize the need for a universal flu vaccine. Next slide. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about that because there are some mechanisms that are simple now, but nonetheless were not fully appreciated before we really understood the structural biology of these viruses. On the left-hand part of the slide is an influenza model. That's the virus. The arrow points to one protein, the hemagglutinin molecule, which is the part that binds to the cell receptor that gets you and I sick when we get the flu. Next slide. Now, a very interesting thing was noticed several years ago is that this is made up, this molecule, of a head and a stem. Now, this is the way it really looks like, but if you want to emphasize it, think of a broccoli with the head and a stalk or a mushroom with a cap and the stalk. The head is the part that the immune system makes a response again. That's the good news. The bad news is that that head is one that has many mutations that change from season to season, the drift that Dr. Schuchert spoke about and that Mr. Goetz spoke about. The stem, however, has few mutations. The little red dots are the mutations. So the trick is, how do you make a response selectively against the part of the virus that does not change as opposed to one that does change? Next slide. There are a number of ways of doing that. I'm gonna just show you one example among many. Investigators at the NIH and funded by the NIH have a situation now where they can take that molecule, that hemagglutinin, and essentially shave off the head. It's called a headless stem. Now, normally, that would fall apart, but it doesn't fall apart because investigators at the Vaccine Research Center have made mutations in the molecule to keep it stable. And what we've done, we've put it on what's called a nanoparticle. That's on the far right of the slide. This is what it looks like 10 million times blown up. So this is a little particle, but all of these are stems, so that when the immune system sees that, it doesn't get distracted about anything else, and it focuses in on making an antibody or a cell-mediated response against something that does not change. Next slide. Now, we recently, in June of this year, had a workshop in Rockville, Maryland, where we called together experts from the United States and throughout the world to help us at NIH to develop what we call a pathway to a universal influenza vaccine. Next slide. And I'm happy to say that just a few days ago, we recently published our strategic plan and our research agenda in the Journal of Infectious Diseases to help us get to the goal that I've just been describing over the last five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that testimony. Uh, Dr. Bright will now recognize you for five minutes for the purposes of your opening statement. Great, thank you. Chairman Harper, Ranking Member DeGette, and distinguished men members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today on behalf of our Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response, the ASPR, to discuss influenza and progress towards the development and availability of effective flu vaccines. I'm Rick Bright, the Director of the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, known as BARDA, and also the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response. ASPR's mission is to save lives and protect Americans from 21st century threats. BARDA is a component of ASPR that it was created to ensure that we have medical countermeasures to protect people from the dire threats we face as a nation. And make no mistake, influenza is one of the most dangerous of those threats. BARDA was established and empowered with special authorities in the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, guided by a national strategy on pandemic influenza and largely funded through supplemental appropriations. We have proven what can be done when the government is able to hire the best people, work with the best partners, and remain focused on a strategic fight against influenza. We have shown that the BARDA model works. With our industry and our federal partners, BARDA has achieved 34 approvals from the FDA for drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics against a wide range of threats. We have increased domestic flu vaccine capacity over tenfold in world-class production facilities. 
We have shortened the vaccine response time with modern technologies, and we have diversified vaccine production platforms, most of that right here in America. No one can rival BARDA's success in expanding capacity and pushing new products to the marketplace. We are proud of these new flu vaccines and the adjuvants now being produced in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Connecticut, and New York. These include the world's first recombinant flu vaccine and the world's largest cell-based vaccine production facility. And we are not done yet. Everything that BARDA and our partners have done and accomplished for pandemic influenza can make our seasonal influenza vaccines better and more responsive to the ever-changing virus. Building on our success, we are poised and we are partnered to make better flu vaccines available right now. Most vaccines today are still made in eggs. Although the process is optimized for efficiency, it has not changed much for decades, and it is no match for a rapidly changing virus. Cell and recombinant-based technologies are now used to make licensed vaccines, and they offer speed and greater flexibility and may even be more effective than traditional egg-based vaccines. Despite these advantages, marketplace competition and limited domestic production capacity have largely kept these approaches on the shelf, representing only a fraction of the seasonal vaccine on the marketplace today. There are actions to improve influenza vaccines now that can produce dramatic near-term benefit in parallel with the long-term efforts being undertaken across the government to develop a universal flu vaccine. To make better, faster flu vaccines now, we propose in collaboration with our industry partners to take the following steps to improve the effectiveness of our existing vaccines. First, we must expand domestic capacity of cell and recombinant-based vaccines. Second, we must enhance their effectiveness with the addition of adjuvants or higher doses of antigen. Third, we need to conduct clinical trials to expand their use in all age groups. And finally, we need to continue modernizing the vaccine production processes for speed and flexibility. While we are grateful for the supplemental funding that disrupted the status quo and fueled our progress, those funds have been fully obligated. To win this battle, it is critical that we sustain these hard-won gains and we implement these steps to, pr to reduce the threat we face every year from influenza. And the near-term vaccine improvement activities are only one piece of the puzzle. Equally important is the ongoing work funded by BARDA to develop diagnostics that can detect influenza sooner, as well as more effective drug treatment options to treat sick people. These priorities combined with improved vaccines represent a comprehensive approach to protecting the nation and the world against influenza. Together with our federal and our industry partners, we have made tremendous progress. However, the threat remains. We stand at a unique, unique moment in time where we have tools and capabilities to dramatically enhance our fight against influenza. I look forward to working with this panel, our committee, your committee, and congressional colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes Scott uh, Gottlieb for five minutes for the purposes of his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member DeGette and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to testify on our response to 2017-2018 seasonal flu. This flu season has been particularly hard. I agree with my colleagues that investing in and working towards the universal flu vaccine is crucial. Unfortunately, Given where we are today in the development process, that reality is still many years off. While we should continue to focus on the discovery of a new breakthrough vaccine, we must also consider what immediate and intermediate steps we can take to enhance the production of existing licensed vaccines, and what should be done to invest in advanced domestic manufacturing to ensure that new and existing technologies are scalable so that manufacturers meet domestic and global demand. There have been successes in developing alternatives to egg-based vaccines, such as cell-based and recombinant technologies, in part because of the collaborations and work by BARDA. However, despite these advances in vaccine development, the majority of manufacturers are still continuing to produce egg-based vaccines. There are reasons for this. The egg-based process works, and the vaccines are safe and effective. But even more so, it would require an enormous investment to fundamentally change manufacturing. However, we believe it's worth better understanding the potential of cell-based or incompetent alternatives. Some studies have found that cell-based or incompetent vaccines are more efficacious or could be more efficacious than egg-based vaccines, but more data and analyses are needed. 
As one step to better understanding the differences between egg-based and cell-based technologies, we're using CMS data to compare Medicare patients that received a cell-based vaccine to those who received an egg-based vaccine to determine which vaccine was more effective in that population. As we consider greater investments in alternative vaccine development processes, it's important to note, however, that there are also challenges with these new cell-based approaches. To help address these challenges, FDA is working to help develop more effective cell lines that can better, be better scaled through continuous manufacturing. We're also looking at how we develop a more robust recombinant vaccine manufacturing process to increase yield while reducing cost. Continuous manufacturing holds great promise for both cell-based and recombinant vaccines because supply could be more easily ramped up on short notice. This would allow us to more rapidly address emerging strains or strain drift. Getting all the necessary preparatory work done is one limiting step of the egg-based processes. The FDA can help industry make investments in these new manufacturing technologies and facilitate such a transition. We need to develop a science-based framework that includes the regulatory tools and guidelines for products to be developed in these systems and to be properly evaluated. And ultimately, our investment will provide regulatory clarity for this kind of new technology. That regulatory framework can increase the efficiency and reduce the cost of transitioning to this kind of new cell-based and recombinant product development manufacturing. More immediately, as we prepare for next year's flu season and analyze the data from this year, we're trying to better understand why this year's vaccine was less effective against H3N2. At FDA's recent advisory committee meeting, the data presented continued to suggest that the strains selected for the 2017 and 2018 vaccines and used by manufacturers reasonably match the circulating strains. This includes the H3N2 strain. Although, although adapting circulating virus strains for manufacture can lead to differences between the circulating strains and the one used for manufacturing, and although those changes could affect vaccine effectiveness, the case this year is likely to be much more complex. And this year is not the first time we've seen vaccines be less effective against H3N2. Recent flu vaccines have proven, on average, to be only about 33% effective against the H3N2 viruses. Given this, we're looking at several factors to better understand why effectiveness tends to be lower against this strain. As we continue to invest in the future of manufacturing and vaccine technology, we also need to remember the importance of simply ensuring that more people get vaccinated with available vaccines each flu season. And we also must work hard to ensure that products used to treat the flu, including antivirals and IV saline, are available and that we take steps to address any potential shortages. As always, FDA remains committed to communicating and sharing updates with the public about all aspects of our flu response. And I look forward to answering your questions today. Thank you. Thanks to each of you for your uh, opening statements. And you know, this is an incredible panel of witnesses uh, that are here today that cover the, the entire spectrum of, of people that are daily dealing with this uh, important issue. So thank you for this time, this education you're giving us. Uh, and so I'm going to recognize myself to ask uh, the first set of questions. And this is uh, for each of you just for quick responses. Uh, if you would just reply to this. Uh, this year has, has been an especially uh, difficult uh, and severe flu season. Uh, a lot of lives have been lost and many people have been hospitalized. Would you get the vaccine and have your loved ones get it also? Um, yes, I get the vaccine every year and make sure my whole family does. Same here. I got the vaccine this year and every year over the last as many years as I can remember has, has my wife and three children. Absolutely. Absolutely, sir. I, I go to the pediatrician with my children and the pediatrician gives it to me and gives it to them. <laughs> That's great. All right. If you get the flu after getting the flu vaccine, is having gotten the flu vaccine likely to reduce the severity of the illness? Yes, there are studies now that have shown reduced severity following immunizations, even when the disease itself isn't prevented. That is true, and that's an important point that many people don't appreciate because they say, I did get the flu even though I got vaccinated. What they don't realize that it is likely, not likely, but it is possible that having gotten the flu without the vaccine would have wound them up in the hospital, particularly if they were someone in the risk groups that are more prone to getting complications. Right. Dr. Ryan. Absolutely. There, there's data to support that the vaccine, even if it's not the most effective vaccine, still does a lot to reduce the severity of illness, reduce hospitalization. I would just echo those statements. Great. 
Now, I, I've heard some concerns uh, that some individuals are worried that they may get the, the, the flu from the flu vaccine. Is that possible? No, the flu vaccine cannot cause the flu. Very few things that you say are impossible, but this is impossible. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. I agree as well, sir. Right. That's great. Uh, there are those misconceptions out there that when I had this esteemed group here, I wanted to make sure that, uh, that, that people realize the, those important facts uh, going forward. Uh, Dr. Shuket, if I may uh, talk to you for a moment. Uh, this year, we've seen a lot of headlines about the flu vaccine's reduced uh, effectiveness. Uh, later, we're gonna, going to ask questions about why we likely saw reduced effectiveness in the flu vaccine. But first, however, I want to ask about vaccine effectiveness for children this year. Uh, yeah. You had, had answered in the, the effectiveness of, of that uh, was 59% effective, much better than it was in adults. But why was it more effective on children than it was, say, older adults? We don't have all the answers, but there are a couple possible explanations. One is children's immune response is often better than adults, particularly better than older adults. A second is your response to an influenza vaccine may differ when it's the first time you've ever been exposed to influenza or the vaccine. You may have a better response. Um, the, some people think that the first um, influenza you're ever exposed to through the vaccine or the um, nature uh, has a long-term effect on your immune response. But we were very pleased to see the better response in children this year. So how do we communicate that? Why is it especially important for school-age children to, to get vaccinated? How do we communicate that? And, and certainly you would agree that's true. Yeah, we have um, simplified our recommendations for children and now we recommend everybody six months and over get a flu vaccine every year. The first time you're getting a flu vaccine, if you're a young child, you're supposed to get two doses of the vaccine. Communication about vaccination has to be multi-sectoral. We think the healthcare provider, pediatricians are the most important influence on kids getting vaccinated, but we also use trusted channels, um, social media, um, in other influencers. You know, we've, we've obviously seen that the number of uh, children receiving the flu vaccine has remained steady at just under 60% of the number of adults receiving the flu vaccines remain fairly steady between 41 and 43%. So how do we do that, not just for children, but for adults also to communicate to America the importance of, of being vaccinated with the flu vaccine? Yeah, there is a nuanced message because being open and honest is really important and not um, promising that the vaccine will, you know, cure cancer. Although we have a vaccine that does that actually, the HPV vaccine, <laughs> sorry. Um, but I think that it, the Americans want us to be open and honest about um, vaccine information. We know that flu vaccines can prevent disease and reduce severity. And we know that um, they can also prevent spread. Children are very important in getting flu, vac uh, flu disease, but also in spreading it. And so getting higher coverage among children is in the whole public's interest. That's great. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes ranking member to get for the purposes of uh, questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, uh, Dr. Fauci, I think everybody on this panel agrees with you when you said that we need to get away from the antiquated production model, which the egg is. And I know um, the chairman particularly appreciated your slideshow. He's, he's new to this subcommittee, so he hasn't seen it before. And he told me he was a chemistry major, so I'm happy to have him to educate me. Um, the, the, um, so the, the recumbent, the, the recumbent um, uh, based based vaccine was only 3% last year, from right. what I understand. I'm wondering if you can talk to me what the barriers are uh, for moving from the current methods that we have, the egg-based methods, which are used for the majority, right. to this cutting-edge vaccine. And I'm gonna ask everybody else for their opinion too yeah. on that. I think there are a few barriers, uh, at least two that stand out. One is that there are still scientific challenges to get the very best recombinant DNA technology. And there are three or four or five in addition to the one that was used in the 3% from protein sciences, the flu block. 
there are things that are even better than that. So we need, and that was part of what I put uh, 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 Congressman to get in the strategic plan, that there are scientific gaps in the arena of what we call platform technology as different types of vaccine. That's the first one, scientific obstacle. The second one that's important is that whenever you have, as, as uh, Dr. Gottlieb mentioned, whenever you have something that's time honored and works and is safe, there is an understanding, fundamental underlying inertia for companies to make a change towards something in which they were gonna have to make a major investment in resources to switch over from one to the other because you have one that you know that works, one sort that of. you know is safe. They're gonna have to make an investment, but the thing that I think we need to emphasize is that we've got to go there. We can't stay stuck in the old technologies. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bright, do you wanna to add to that? I, I think everything Dr. Fauci said is, is spot on. I mean, but in addition to those, it's about the capacity and the yields of the new technology. So we've had 70 years to optimize the efficiency and the yields for an egg-based vaccine. We've had about five years to try to work on optimization of recombinant and cell-based vaccines. So it's remarkable to see the progress that's being made in those companies to improve the efficiency of production and the yields of those vaccines. Another challenge, however, though, is the benefit of the vaccines is blended together in the marketplace. So there hasn't been a right. focus on getting the differentiated data set to show the benefit and effectiveness of egg-based or non-egg-based vaccines. We all know the benefits of, of non-egg-based vaccines is speed and flexibility. Those are critical for a pandemic response. That's critical if we had to change late season for a virus drift. We're also getting the additional data now to understand the true effectiveness difference. So, um, Dr. Gottlieb, did you want to add anything? I, mean, my, I, I agree with my colleagues. I'll just add, you know, with the recombinant processes, one of the challenges still is the cell, ba the, the, the cell culture and the yield you're able to derive using the recombinant process. And, you know, while we've commented that we observe better efficacy with the cell-based vaccine this year relative to the egg-based vaccine, it is the case that in some years we observe better efficacy with the egg-based process versus the cell-based process. And so I think the underlying uh, message here is, from, from my standpoint, is the egg-based process is safe and effective. It works. Um, the challenge with it is sort it's of. hard to scale and right. it's hard to make a mid-season change. And it's, it's also hard if you have a pandemic flu that hits. Uh, I, I'm wondering if, if any of you can, did, Dr. Chukat, did you want to add? I didn't want to leave yeah, you just, out. Just to say that the investments in vaccine effectiveness studies on a large scale are really worthwhile. It's only recently that we could tell you that the effectiveness against H3N2 is less than against H1N1 and B, or that children have higher effectiveness. Because the studies were, and, and so aside from funding, I'll ask any of you, I don't have much time left, is there anything else Congress can do to move this along? Because I remember years ago asking the same questions. I'm glad we've made some progress, but clearly we're gonna have to get to the gold standard. I'll just, I mean, if I may just um, quickly comment, uh, Congresswoman, uh, as part of the president's budget this year, we did put forward a proposal to try to make investments in continuous manufacturing. That was that was geared towards this yes. kind of an opportunity yes. um, to try to establish the regulatory parameters to enable these innovations to come forward. Yes. Anyone else? And again, I mean, it does go back to funding in some ways, but just the support to encourage the movement to the modernized technologies, in addition to expanding their domestic capacity so we have them when we need them. Okay, I think you can say we've got bipartisan support for that on this committee, right, Mr. Chairman? I believe that's true. Yeah. That's Thank right. you, I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Chair, we'll now recognize uh, Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, Greg Walden, for the purposes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thanks to our very distinguished panel of witnesses, not only for your help in crafting public policy here today, but also the great work you do every day uh, to improve the lives and the health of Americans and, and frankly, people around the world. Um, Dr. Gottlieb, one of the treatments that's available for individuals uh, who get the flus is the antivirals. We've talked some about that today. Are antiviral drugs more effective the earlier they are given? They are, Congressman. And how do they work? Um, the currently the available um, <laughs> antiviral drug works by blocking a different, um, a different step in the replication cycle of the virus itself than the one that the vaccine targets. The va vaccine targets the ability of the virus to attach to the cell membrane in the lungs. All right. And last week, the FDA issued a press release warning of fraudulent and unapproved flu products. 
Why did uh, you, you feel uh, that press release was necessary to warn consumers to be cautious? Because we see a lot of uh, efforts online to try to entice consumers to purchase products that we know are fraudulent, that are making false claims, false and misleading claims, um, that are claiming to have antiviral and anti-flu effects um, when in fact they're not approved for those purposes, including and, dietary supplements. And, and if, uh, if consumers feel like they've been defrauded, what, what should they do? Um, well, they should certainly, I think that any consumer that feels they might have used a product um, that was making um, an inappropriate or fraudulent claim should cer certainly contact their uh, medical provider um, and certainly refer the information to uh, FDA. All right. And, and recently, as I mentioned uh, in my comments at the beginning, a new antiviral drug was approved in Japan or is in that process that supposedly has the potential to treat the flu in just one dose. Are you familiar with that product? and? Can you talk to us a little about whether that's the case and what we might see here? So I'm familiar with the product. I would defer to my colleagues on the panel a little bit. I, would, I will just say that the, um, what, they've, what the sponsor has said publicly is that um, they plan to submit an application at some point this year, and they currently have disclosed that they have some studies ongoing um, in the U.S. looking at a high-risk population. This is a drug that acts at a different point in a replication cycle, mechanistically an earlier stage in replication than the other drug that you referenced, so it is differentiated. And the other um, you know, potential opportunity is that the onset of action um, appears to be earlier than the currently available uh, antiviral. I think the bottom line message is that we are very interested in having um, a spectrum of antiviral drugs that act differently at different points in the virus, if case the virus itself becomes resistant to one approach at targeting the virus, we have backups and we have alternative approaches. Very good. Other members of the panel want to comment on that specifically, and then I have one other question. I can add to that, yes. So Bart has been engaged with um, this company developing this drug for quite some time, as well as some other companies that we're supporting to develop new classes of antiviral drugs for influenza. It's critical to note that we have not had a new class of antivirals to approved for influenza in over 20 years. Wow. We rely on a single class of influenza antivirals now. And the virus, as we know, continues to change, and resistance to that class of antivirals continues to emerge. It is very concerning in avian influenza viruses, such as pandemic strains H5N1, H7, and 9, to see these high levels of resistance emerging to that class of drugs. So it's remarkable that this company took the lead in developing a new class of antiviral drug. It has attributes of a single dose instead of five days of twice a day dosing. It brings down the viral load in the patient very rapidly, faster than the currently approved antiviral drugs. And it has this new mechanism of action. So if a virus becomes resistant to the only approved class of drugs we have now, this drug would still work. And it can also be used potentially in combination with the existing class of drugs. Another thing exciting about this drug is that they partnered now with a U.S.-based company. That U.S.-based company has taken the lead in bringing that to the FDA for discussions and consideration for approval in the United States. And their plans are to transfer the knowledge and the capability to manufacture that drug in the United States in the near term. So again, it's one of about a dozen or a half dozen promising candidates with new mechanisms of actions, several of those supported by BARDA and even monoclonal antibodies to make better treatments for flu. Yeah, Dr. Fauci. So I can't help myself on this, Mr. Chairman, for the, for the benefit of uh, Chairman Harper, is that um, <laughs> uh, Rick Wright said that this is very extraordinary that the company did this. However, the first recognition of this particular mechanism was in a paper from 1979 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences who, who funded authored that? by the National Institutes of Health. Okay, it's it entitled Transfer of 5' prime Terminal Cap of Globulin mRNA to Influenza Viral Complementary RNA During Transcription. So it just goes to show you, I mean, that basic science is the root of everything we do, even something that 20 years later turns into a product made by a Japanese company. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll let you, that's good, you know, and that's part of why we did 21st Century Cure is to continue that funding and that cycle and all. I was hoping to ask a question about domestic manufacturing of vaccines and threats and opportunities, but my time has expired and maybe we can get some of that uh, as the hearing continues. Thank you again for your good work and for being here. Gentleman yields back. Chair will now recognize gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for five minutes.
I want to thank you, Dr. Fauci, for that addendum um, and the information. I think it's really important to appreciate how much um, our researchers and the federal government contributes to addressing these. Um, so I have some basic questions as just an ordinary um, consumer and, and person. I think, Dr. Um, Shuket, you might be the person to ask. Can you tell us generally how easy it is to um, spread the flu virus person to person? Yeah, the, it, it varies by strain, but of course, this is one of the more infectious or contagious viruses that we have. And so um, in a household, spread is frequent. In a school, spread is frequent. Um, it can be spread through respiratory droplets or through fomites sort of on your hand. That's why you've seen us so many times say, cover your nose when you cough or sneeze um, and don't touch your eyes or mouth after you're, um, you know, uh, with your hands, you know, sort of wash your hands frequently. Um, and how, how long is a person contagious with the flu? Is it possible for a person to be contagious and, and not know it? You can be contagious before you develop symptoms, and usually we say about 24 or 48 hours after the fever goes down. Again, with influenza, it varies by virus and by year, but that's sort of the general, the general facts. 24 hours to after, 48 hours after the fever. After the fever goes down. Goes down, mm -hmm. right. Um, so um, the CDC recommends that people stay home for 24 hours after their fever breaks. But I wanted to point out, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 28% of workers have no access at all to paid sick leave. And this is particularly a problem for those in the lowest uh, income, lowest wage jobs. One third of lower paid workers, including those who work in fields such as food preparation, um, have no paid sick leave. And in fact, the United States is the only industrialized country in the world without paid sick leave. I leave this to anyone, really. Can you explain why it's important for people to stay home when they're sick? We're really trying to limit the spread of the virus. And so staying home while you're sick will help you heal, but also keep you from spreading to others. Um, so in, in, in 2016, the National Bureau of Economic Research found that if paid sick leave were mandated, it would prevent 100 flu-like infections per week for every 100,000 people. So when people can stay home um, when they're sick, um, people are less likely to, uh, to, to get the flu. So I know this is not your jurisdiction, um, but I think it's just important to, to note that some of the cautions that we suggest for people are really hard to abide by if you are depending on that uh, on that paycheck for for that day. I think we need to think about it. It's a public health issue. Paid sick leave is a public health issue. Um, I, I wanted to also note that um, Heather, um, what's it, Heather Holland? Heather Holland in Texas, a, a Texas mother, 38 years old, died because she could not afford the copay for Tamiflu, which was $116. And uh, she had insurance, so this was a copay. Um, so first of all, Tamiflu, would it have helped her if she took it in time? And what do we say about that? $116 um, for a low-income family is a lot of money, even when insured. Can someone comment on that? I can, oh, okay, yeah, I can just say that um, in response to the spot shortage of antiviral medicines this year, um, we work closely with manufacturers and pharmacies and insurers, and we learned that there was actually plenty of supply, but much of what was available was brand product rather than the generics, the newer generics. We did, in the midst of the season, get some agreement by pharmacies or the pharmacy benefit managers and insurers to offer the generic as um, preferred brand or as, um, sorry, to offer the brand as either generic or preferred brand, which would give a lower copay. But of course, you know, that's a very, very sad story. We don't know that antivirals will cure a person. The, the best data suggests they shorten the course of illness. And of course, pro beginning, being, being able to start them quickly is what we think helps reduce the severe complications. So then in conclusion, let me just say, um, Paid sick leave and affordable pharmaceuticals 
very important issues that we need to grapple with as we put in context this uh, flu virus. Thank you. Gentlewoman yields back. The chair will now recognize gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This has been very informative. I appreciate all the testimony. Uh, you all are doing uh, some great things. Um, I will tell you, it's kind of interesting, and it was timely on uh, February 28th, just a week or so ago, I got an email from a constituent who apparently keeps up with a lot of these issues. And uh, he started talking in his email about Nana flu and what was going on and how we might be able to push that particular product forward. And one of the things that he raised in his comments that I thought was very interesting, he says that they're planning, they've already done phase one, so I guess we're, we're coming to you, uh, Dr. Gottlieb. But he, he said they've already done phase one human trials. They don't plan to do phase two until the third quarter of 2018, because obviously you want the flu to be out there to a certain extent in order to be able to test it. And he said, you know, I don't, and I'm going to quote from his email, I do not understand why the FDA and CDC do not push a vaccine like this ahead. It would seem to me they, they, might, be, they might push for phase two in Australia this year and possibly a phase three uh, this year in the U.S. That could make the vaccine available for flu season starting in the fall of 2019. If the government is really serious about speeding up the slow approval process and reducing health costs, a process like this would help to do it. And I asked the question because it makes some sense. Why are we using the Australian flu season to start testing some of these new ideas? You've indicated, uh, several of you have, that there may be 20 or 30 or 40 new products out there. And wouldn't we be able to shorten that time period, particularly in the live trials, if we did some of it here and some of it there when we're, where they have the opposite seasons and a, and a different flu season as well. So I'll start with you and I welcome anybody's comments. Uh, I'll just comment briefly, uh, Congressman, I'm, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the product. I think this is a recombinant vaccine that you're referring to. I, I believe that it is too. I'm not well enough versed in it to say, but yes, and, it, and it's been okay. tested mostly, I think, uh, comparing it to the, the vaccine for senior adults. But since I'm apparently rapidly approaching that uh, category, right. I, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I turn 60 later this month. I'll just say, I, you know, it is, is not uncommon to see products tested in the southern hemisphere, so I'm not sure what the particular circumstance here is, but it, that is an, a common phenomenon um, with, with new products. We, you'll, you'll see them tested there to help accelerate the development process. So I can tell Pastor Jones that y'all are not against it. You, um, you could pass on to anyone that we are willing to actively engage with any sponsor that's developing an innovative product in this space. Yeah, and because, Mr. Griffith, that. it's 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 not it's not a testing in Australia versus here. The product that your constituency was referring to is the nanoparticle that's gone into phase one, the one I showed you the model of. Right. The reason it's not going to go into phase two, from the standpoint of until the end of the year, is really a production capability. It's what Dr. Gottlieb referred to when he said what we haven't gotten efficient yet is the yield of this. So we don't have enough GMP product to start a phase two until the end of 2018. It's not that we, that the FDA is holding us up or anything. It's just that we don't have enough product. Well, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Bright, did you want to weigh in? I was going to weigh in and say it's very typical. You, when you develop any new vaccine, it, it's difficult and takes time. When you develop an influenza vaccine, you have to time it with an outbreak of influenza. So as long as it's under a U.S. IND, we are very flexible in allowing the companies to get the data and conduct clinical studies wherever flu might be in the world, as long as it's following that IND process. Well, that's great. I appreciate y'all helping me uh, uh, answer that question. And I know that uh, Mr. Jones, who I spoke with uh, yesterday, make sure I could s say his name uh, in public. He he'll be very pleased to hear that as well. Uh, let me ask this because uh, the chairman brought it up uh, just, and if y'all can get to it briefly. The domestic supply and the threat of maybe having our supply mostly offshore uh, of of our flu vaccines, and it doesn't matter to me who wants to respond to that. I guess that would be uh, Asper. Dr. We, work, we work very hard. It's a very important question. We've worked very hard over the last years and invested great sums of money to make sure we can develop these vaccines and get them licensed. It's critical now that we expand that domestic manufacturing capacity so not only they are able to meet a seasonal market demand, but they're also available when we need them for a pandemic. In a pandemic situation, we know we cannot import vaccines from other countries easily. 
So the domestic manufacturing capability, these modern technologies for recombinant cell base is absolutely critical to our national security. And I appreciate that, and my time is just about up, but I would say could you please let us know what we can do to assist uh, in trying to get more uh, onshore production, and I yes. yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here and everything you do to, to help keep Americans healthy and safe. Uh, we're now exiting peak flu season, but we're entering uh, allergy season. And what I've learned over the past uh, decade is that our allergy seasons are longer and more intense, that we have hotter days. Back home in Florida, the pollen is already raging. What, what advice do you give to families uh, uh, with children and others in vulnerable populations that are on alert because of the intensity of the flu season as they begin to, to deal with allergies. When is the appropriate time to, to head right to the doctor's office and get checked out if you have a flu? Is, is it the onset of fever or Dr. Fauci? If the question you're asking is the overlap between the two and how do you know which one it is? Well, the recommendations that we get from the CDC, and I'll, I'll mm -hmm. yield to Dr. Shukat in a second, but what we say is that if you have symptoms that persist, number one, that certainly is something you want to go to a physician for. If you have a situation where you look like you're recovering and then you have a relapse, it could possibly be a bacterial infection. But importantly, if you fall into one of the risk categories, mm -hmm. elderly, underlying disease like heart disease, chronic lung disease, diabetes, obesity, pregnancy, child from birth to four years old, you should not hesitate to see a physician because that's the group that really would benefit from getting an, anti -retro, an antiviral drug like Tamiflu. And that's the reason why the CDC recommends that we do that. And uh, Anne, you might wanna. Yeah, and I would just say that even though we're pleased that the peak of the season seems to have passed, there's still a lot of flu mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. And the B strains are um, more common right now than they were a few weeks ago. So um, we certainly look for fever with flu or flu-like illness. But um, as Dr. Fauci did describe, the warning signs, things like getting better and then getting worse is a warning sign. Difficulty breathing, a very high persistent mm -hmm. fever, um, for children, you know, not being very responsive or being hard to wake up. Those are really important things to You learn. know, and I continue to hear the refrain from folks that uh, don't get a flu shot, that they don't get it because last time they got it, it, it made them sick. And that's the reason that they, they don't get the flu shot. What do you say to them? Yeah, the, um, the influenza vaccines don't cause flu. There can be some um, feeling of not being that, not feeling that well. But in general, um, we give flu vaccines and it's during a season where there's a lot of other stuff out there, and so those symptoms are rarely related to the vaccine itself. We had a season this year because before we had the peak of flu, there was a lot of para-influenza and even respiratory syncytial virus among adults that we were seeing, at least at our clinical center at the NIH. So that was before the onset of the flu. And people were saying, well, I already got the flu, therefore I don't need a vaccine. Well, they're wrong on two accounts. One, because they likely did not have the flu, they had something else. And even if you have the flu, you should still get a vaccine because there are other components in the vaccine that could protect you against the other flu that's circulating besides just H3N2. And if I might add, this is an area for innovation that is just screaming out to give patients more information, more knowledge about what they might be exposed to in the home. And it's one of the reasons we're trying to drive diagnostics out of centralized laboratories into the homes of the patients so they have actionable information to be able to distinguish if they have a bacterial infection or a viral infection or flu or some other areas. So they can take responsible actions to get treated sooner and to take actions to reduce the spread of that virus. Thank you. And preliminary estimates are that this year's flu vaccine shows 36% effectiveness. I wanna hear more about how we assess vaccine effectiveness uh, to better understand this measure. Dr. Shukat, how, how do we test for vaccine effectiveness? And what does it mean that the vaccine is 36% effective? And is it true that this effectiveness was different uh, for different age groups? Yes, we have a multi-state, multi-site um, network that tests vaccine effectiveness. And they um, evaluate people who come in with symptoms consistent with influenza, do laboratory testing 
of them, those who have confirmed laboratory proven influenza are enrolled as um, cases, and those who have um, those symptoms but didn't have laboratory confirmed control uh, influenza are, are enrolled as controls. We compare vaccination history verified with the records in them and then do sort of math to calculate what the vaccine effectiveness is against um, particular types in particular age groups. Um, the larger the sample, the more we can look at ages in narrow categories and look at the different types. We do um, interim estimates in January, February each year, and then end of season estimates. Um, if we had a larger sample, we would a larger network, we would be able to more reliably look at the age groups, but potentially also look at different types of vaccine, like the cell-based or the um, egg-based. And I guess your overriding message is no matter what percentage uh, you come up with, it benefits you and uh, your neighbors and the, your family to get your flu shot. The flu vaccine is the best way to protect yourself and your family against influenza, and some protection is better than no protection. Thank you very much. Gentlewoman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. While we're on the commercial to get your flu shot, I want to thank Dr. Fauci personally because he told me in December I better get it, and I did, and I didn't get the flu this year, so I thank you for that, and it has been a it has been a tough year back in, back in Texas. Uh, Dr. Bright, you said that there had not been a new antiviral introduced in the past 20 years. Is that, did I understand that correctly? That is true. Well, 1999 with the approval of oseltamivir and zanamivir. So let me, um, I guess this question is to Dr. Fauci and Dr. Gottlieb. Um, Dr. Fauci, as far as the scientific side, Dr. Gottlieb, as far as the regulatory side, why is this so difficult? I mean, a, a, a virus is a pretty simple, uh, organism, nowhere near as sophisticated as a mammalian cell. It seems like selective toxicity. You talk about it a little bit in that in that paper that you that you showed us. It seems like that should be pretty straightforward. It seems that way, but uh, and you're right. There are there are targets in the replication cycle, polymerase and other uh, uh, protease and other in inhibitors that uh, we have for that. The interesting thing is that we, even though we're doing the fundamental basic research to examine that. We have not had an overwhelming uh, amount of interest on the part of companies, which is the reason why BARDA has been so important in helping to chaperone the companies along to get involved in this. So it really is, you're right, it isn't a, um, an, a completely insurmountable scientific problem. It has a replication cycle. Remember, when we put all of that effort into looking at the various aspects of the replication cycle of HIV, we came up with now a total of 30 effective drugs. There's no reason why, with the right scientific and industry interest in it, that we couldn't do the same thing. And I just yield to my colleagues to my left to amplify that. Well, Dr. Gottlieb, then I assume on the regulatory side, that is something that's work you'd be prepared to, to take up. Well, absolutely, and I think there's a lot of interest in, in um, seeing differentiated products put forward that can address the flu for a whole host of reasons, not least of which is the strategic rationale of having that, that available. I will just comment that you know, the standards for approval are relatively straightforward, and I think the agency would show a lot of interest and a lot of high-level attention um, to products that were put forward to try to address um, both pandemic flu as well as the seasonal flu. I will comment that there have been safety issues associated with products that have been in early stages of development in the past. But one of the bigger challenges, quite frankly, and this is a little bit outside my, my remit, but they have been commercial challenges, just, just the ability um, to get a commercial return on a product targeted to seasonal flu. And I will remind the committee that at the time that the agency approved um, Tamiflu, uh, the agency was roundly criticized by many outside groups, not, not by Congress, but by outside groups for that approval who commented that a, a drug that diminished um, flu symptoms by 1.42 days wasn't something the agency ought to be approving. And so, you know, we, our mindset has changed around this, but, um, but in some quarters, not entirely. That, that's an incredibly important point. I was in practice at that time, and that did, that did temper your judgment about writing this prescription, uh, regardless of cost, if it's really only marginally effective, uh, why put someone through the potential side effects that possibly would, would occur? And Dr. Bright, you, you provide the market that Dr. Fauci referenced is, is not 
readily available, so it's hard to incent companies to take these challenges on. But you provide the market, right? You're going to be the one, the, the bulk purchaser of this stuff. Well, the marketplace for antivirals for seasonal flu is, is the marketplace. And, and it, I don't think there's full appreciation and recognition of the impact and, and benefit that one could receive from getting an antiviral drug in a timely manner when they're infected with influenza. We had a new antiviral, same class from the uh, Tamiflu, approved by a company in Biochris called Paramivir just a few years ago. And there's still very little uptake of that new antiviral drug. And it's a single dose IV administered drug. So there is hesitancy in the marketplace to develop new antiviral drugs, even with benefits and reducing viral load and, and, and saving um, the, reducing the severity of illness, if the marketplace and the patients and the healthcare system doesn't understand and appreciate the power of that drug. Let me just ask you a, a related question. On, you talked about bringing down the viral load. Kind of encountered with when, when Ebola was causing all of the problems, the rapid reduction of the viral load caused kind of a Herxheimer reaction in some patients and, and that caused some concern. Is that, is that something, a phenomenon with which you are concerned with, uh, with these types of medications? We haven't seen that with influenza antiviral drugs. Reduction of viral load we believe would lead to less transmission, we believe would lead to less severe illness in influenza antivirals. Yes, Dr. Fett. And in Ebola that was more a viremia as opposed to what you see with influenza, which is mostly a local reaction in the lung. So you would not expect a Hertzheimer's with that. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome to our panelists. Uh, data from the uh, National Immunization Survey found that fewer than half of children and adults were vaccinated by November of this current flu season. Only about 40% of people six months and older received the flu vaccine. These numbers uh, appear to be just about what they were in the last couple of flu seasons. And just interested in hearing from this panel about um, why you believe these numbers continue to be in that realm and just how do you approach that as an organization? Um, Dr. Shuket, uh, the data show that nearly 60% of Americans did not take advantage of that flu vaccination. Is that an accurate number? You know, the numbers that you're citing are from November, and those are our um, uh, early results. By the end of the season, what we've seen the last several years is that about 48% of Americans get the flu vaccine, much higher in children, about 59%, and 43% or so in adults. There's a lot of mixed messages. And when we, you know, the thing with influenza, when we have a year like this where it's so severe, everybody actually knows how bad it can be. But then there's also questions about whether the vaccine is helpful or not. It's really important for the clinicians and um, for us in public health to remind people that the vaccine has provided protection, particularly in children, and that getting the vaccine each year is worthwhile. And Dr. Shuket, again, and Dr. Gottlieb, perhaps, um, what have, um, You've been with the have your organization been doing to improve the uh, the rate, if anything. Right, we do um, quite a bit of research on communication. We've done, I think, more than 30 studies to test messages over the past 18 years to try to understand what motivates individuals as well as what influences clinicians in giving a strong recommendation. One of the biggest factors for patients is a strong recommendation from their doctor. We've seen an increase in OBGYNs recommending the vaccine and more women who are pregnant getting flu vaccine each year, really after they saw how severe it was in 2009 when you were pregnant and got influenza. But we've probably hit a wall right now. And after this season, there's a lot of concern that um, we don't know how the uh, medical community or public is going to react. So we're, we're out there doing research right now and testing messages for next fall. We do um, use multiple channels in doing communication about vaccine, both um, traditional channels and, and social media, um, trying to find influencers and address the myths that people have. 
Mm -hmm. And Dr. Gottlieb? I would just comment, I think, I think the CDC has the most robust platform for communicating, but, but we, we not only echo the CDC recommendations in their statements, but, uh, but put out a number of our own to try to, to try to build on that. And I think one of the things we did this season in particular was try to be very transparent about what we were learning about the vaccine effectiveness as we learned it um, to continue to remind providers in particular and, and consumers that this vaccine still had efficacy and it had efficacy in particular against H1N1 and the B, vaccine, B virus, which tend to peak later in the season. So even if people perceived as being less efficacious against H3N2, there was still a lot of value in getting vaccinated because later in the season, you, you tend to see an upswing in the H1N1 and, and B, B virus, as we're seeing right now. And the vaccine was actually quite effective against those strains. And in terms of the 100% number that uh, obviously is something that sounds like you shoot for, how important it is, is it to reach that? Um, with many vaccines, there's direct protection, but also indirect protection. And at a certain level, um, the higher proportion of the population that's vaccinated, they may actually be helping others not get sick. So in particular, I think the, the pediatric vaccination is important for the children. It's also important for the adults that often get flu from their kids or from their grandkids. Yeah. Representative Castor touched on this a bit. The, uh, this season we saw many news reports focused on the fact that the vaccine was only 36% effective. In addition, some inaccurate and misleading social media posts have warned people against vaccinating themselves or their children. Um, Dr. Shuka, does CDC have any way of tracking how these media sources impact the number of people who are actually vaccinated? We, we do um, um, assess attitudes periodically and try to understand whether there are um, rumors that are resonating or not. You know, when we ask, when we do research on why didn't you get vaccinated for influenza, we hear more often about the, um, well, I heard that's not an effective vaccine rather than concerns about safety or concerns about um, uh, cost. But I think that um, it varies for each vaccine what the, what the barriers are or what the concerns are. We work hard through um, our messaging, but also through um, partners and others to get the word out. You know, sometimes the faith-based community can reach a lot of people in some areas. We, they're mommy bloggers that are influential in some circles. Um, friends and family can be influential. Our most critical audience are clinicians and healthcare providers because doctors, nurses, pharmacists have a lot of influence on, on people's behavior. Thank you very much. Anyone else that wanted to come on in that? If not, I yield back and thank you, Mr. Chair. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Indiana, uh, Ms. Brooks, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to all the panelists for being here, and thank you for your service. Um, as uh, the panel here may or may not know, Congresswoman Eshu and I uh, recently started a biodefense caucus. Would encourage all of the members here to consider joining our caucus, um, and this is in a lead up to uh, the hopeful reauthorization of PAPA. Um, but I want to, talk, to go back a little bit because during the 21st Century Cures debate, um, we did get signed into law um, the return of contracting authority to BARDA. And I'm curious, uh, Dr. Bright, um, this was something we wanted it restored. It was in the original uh, passage when BARDA was created. But it's my understanding there's been some hesitation by the contracting office to move the contracting back over to BARDA. Has that contracting authority yet been properly restored to you since it was authorized uh, and passed into law under 21st Century Cures? You know, thank you for the question, and we're so grateful for 21st Century Cures to include that in the law that passed. It's critically important. It has not been finalized yet, but it's important to know that it is part of an overall realignment of the entire ASPR organization, and we look forward to the full implementation of that very soon. And what is the holdup? The holdup is the, the, the alignment with the overall realignment of ASPR. So it is fully intended, Dr. Cadillac, our ASPR and I are in full alignment to implement this as quickly as possible. We anticipate it will be done in a matter of months. Okay. Um, we'll continue to ask questions until we hear that what uh, was authorized in 21st Century Cures has been implemented. Um, I, I do have a question, uh, though, in the original PAPA, uh, it's my understanding that BARDA was also given other transaction authority to reduce regulatory burden on the federal contracting process that could both inhibit innovation and our preparedness. Is BARDA able 
to use that other authority that was in the original uh, in the original Papa bill? BARTA has been using other transactional authorities now. We have six of those in place with different industry ent entities. The, the process of getting the other transactional authorities is still uh, a, a process that's going to outside senior procurement executive that we're working on improving the effectiveness and efficiency of that process now with our ASPR. But we are finding ways to utilize that OTA, other transactional authority, effectively. Okay, thank you. Sorry you're on the hot seat today. However, with the reauthorization of PAPA, um, uh, coming uh, with it due to expire in September. Um, talk to me about the administration's fiscal year 2019 request of 250 million for pandemic influenza. Can you explain at BARDA, uh, authorization of pan flu program at BARDA, I assume uh, is beneficial, assuming it is authorized or reauthorized. Would you agree? <laughs> It's absolutely essential, yes. Can you share with us how those funds would be used to prepare for the next influenza pandemic? Well, I described for you a lot of the work that's been done already with the investment that we've been provided in, in supplemental funds, and those funds are all obligated. And we've made great strides with our industry partners to make our, our country better prepared for pandemic influenza. But there's a lot of work still to be done. As I said, we need to expand the access and availability of the vaccines we've created so they're useful and available for all ages. We still need to develop additional antiviral drugs. We need more drugs, more treatment op options to treat people who are severely ill and hospitalized with influenza. And we need to do a better job with our diagnostics as well. We need to make sure the diagnostics are in the hands of the people who need them so they can get treated sooner and they can take responsible actions to reduce the spread of that virus. All of that work is yet to be done in the context of still sustaining what we've built, we have to sustain the infrastructure. That is our response capability for a pandemic in our nation. So in the context of sustaining and filling the gaps, that's how we would support and use those funds. And in my 47 seconds left, can you talk about the importance of sustained and robust funding? Um, sustained being the critical word here, and why is that so critically important? the sustainment of the funding because we rely on these facilities and these companies to be available and, and producing vaccine that's warm based. So when we need it, we need it quickly that they are have the staff in place and the capabilities in place and the, the FDA is able to continue reviewing and approving that facility. It's important that we don't let the eye off, are off the ball for sustainment. If the factories close, we have no response. We've, we've gained nothing. At the same time, we must sustain our momentum in conducting and supporting the phase two and phase three clinical studies for additional recombinant-based technologies for vaccines, for the platform-based technologies in a regional manufacturing um, process across our country so we can rely on those quickly when we need them for pandemic. Thank you, I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair will now recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Walters, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, California was hit particularly hard this year by the, um, by the flu season. And my home of Orange County especially suffered with well over twice the number of flu cases compared to last year. Orange County had at least a dozen influenza-related deaths in individuals under the age of 65. Uh, yet we all know that seniors are partic particularly susceptible to the flu. Uh, the CDC states that at least 75% of flu-related deaths occur in people 65 and older. Uh, my district is home to a large retirement population, so I'm especially concerned about the health of this group during uh, flu season. While the overall flu vaccine effectiveness rate for this year is 36%, the effectiveness rate can vary depending on age group. For instance, last year the overall effectiveness rate was 40% and the effectiveness rate for seniors was only 25%. One would suspect the vaccine effectiveness rate is lower for vulnerable populations like seniors, but I noticed that the 2016-2017 vaccine effectiveness rate was much more effective for children, another vulnerable population. Some of my colleagues have asked what accounts for the variability in flu vaccine effectiveness among age groups. What can be done to improve vaccine effectiveness for seniors? I can begin. Um, there have been efforts to um, um, develop different influenza vaccine products, particularly for seniors and others with weaker immune systems. 
One such approach is a high-dose product that's been licensed. Another approach is adjuvanted. A key um, strategy that we have at CDC is to make sure that patients and clinicians know that people at high risk for complications, including seniors, get promptly treated with antivirals if they do get sick. But the immune system does age, and we think that the frailer elderly have a poor response to many vaccines, including flu. Whenever we have a situation, for example, when we uh, are making a vaccine for a possible pandemic, we always test it not only in healthy adults, but we also test it in the elderly to make sure that the dose and the regimen that we have gives a comparable response that a younger person would have. So that's part of the testing. And as Dr. Schick had said, the two major areas are the higher dose, which is recommended for, for seniors. It's, it's a much higher dose than the dose that you give to a healthy young person, as well as using adjuvants, which is a product that's not a vaccine, but it boosts the response to the vaccine. If I could add too, I mean, this is a lesson from pandemic influenza vaccine development that we can transition to seasonal influenza vaccine development. We know in a pandemic vaccine, we have to have higher doses of antigen and we have to have adjuvants in those vaccines to make them immunogenic and effective across all age groups. I recently in the last two weeks visited the senior leadership of each of the licensed influenza vaccine manufacturers for the United States and talk to them about this challenge, about what their thoughts and strategies and how we can improve the effectiveness of our existing vaccines while we wait for the universal flu vaccine. Each of them is poised and strategic in thinking about ways to add the adjuvant and increase the dose of their vaccine. They're all partnered and, and interested in utilizing cell-based and recombinant-based vaccines as well to try to improve the effectiveness over the egg-based vaccines. I'll just comment um, very briefly, Congresswoman, that we're, we're actively looking at data uh, as to the relative effectiveness of the um, vaccine with the MF59 adjuvant and the high-dose vaccine in elderly, elderly patients relative to um, the normal uh, vaccine, the regular dose vaccine with the 15 micrograms of, uh, of antigen. Um, and I think if, if we do observe differences between the high-dose vaccine, the efficacy of the high-dose vaccine, or the vaccine with the adjuvant and relative to the, to the regular seasonal flu vaccine, it could offer some, some clues as to why the vaccine overall was less effective against H3N2. We will have that data available hopefully shortly. We're working very closely with CMS to derive those results, and we're going to make it available um, as, as soon as we have it. Okay. Um, and Dr. Shook, in uh, 2009, the FDA approved a high-dose version of the flu vaccine for elder, elderly individuals. There is a study that indicates the high-dose vaccine was 24.2% more effective in preventing the flu in adults aged 65 and older as compared to the standard dose vaccine. Uh, can you elaborate on whether the high-dose vaccine would significantly reduce flu-related deaths among seniors? Even a 20 some percent superior response is still not, um, you know, 100 percent because of the um, the weaker immune response that seniors get. We have um, the the market of the higher dose product has been increasing since it was uh, became available. Um, CDC doesn't recommend a preference for the high dose over the regular dose vaccine. One of the things we found is that. Um, the vaccine that they have at the doctor's office or the pharmacy is the one that you should get because um, there may not be the other product if you're looking for it. But I think the additional studies that, C C uh, that FDA is doing with CMS and we've done with CMS in the past has helped us build this evidence base of what's the best way to protect seniors. Okay. Thank you. And I'm out of time. Thank you. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you and the uh, ranking member for allowing me to wave on. I'm an alumni of this subcommittee. <laughs> and uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm going to thank the chair for holding this hearing on the current flu season. The 2017-18 flu season has been one of the worst in recent years, resulting in tens of thousands of hospitalizations and likely thousands of flu-related deaths around the country. There has been some advances in both vaccine technology and in antiviral drugs, which hopefully can both reduce the number of people who get the flu and help those who do get it to recover more quickly. I understand there's a new vaccine production method um, based on recomb recombinant protein technology that makes it less likely for a vaccine to mutate as it is, as it is being grown. 
Dr. Bright Barta has supported the development of several vaccines based on this technology, as well as the development of cell-based vaccines and antigen uh, spare, sparing vaccines. Can you explain why Barta has chosen to support research on these vaccine production methods rather than the egg-based production methods? Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, we primarily primarily focus on supporting those new modern technologies to be able to respond faster and more effectively to a pandemic response. We know that you can cut out steps necessary to make a vaccine in the egg. You don't need a virus to grow and to produce vaccines in a recombinant-based system. You can start from a gene sequence and rapidly go into production of your vaccine. This affords us great flexibility and great speed compared to egg-based vaccines. We're learning now that, that investments in those new technologies might offer, also offer us those advantages of a potentially more effective flu vaccine. What's critical to know about this, too, is it's one thing to license those vaccines and make them available, but if they're not available in sufficient supply and don't have the capacity to produce it, then they are not penetrating the marketplace, and those companies are frail and vulnerable at risk of going out of business after huge investment if that vaccine is not used. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Gottlieb. Preliminary data suggests that some of the newer vaccines, such as high-dose vaccines, may offer greater protection. Is there enough data on these vaccines for the FDA to recommend these vaccines over others? If not, what type of data would the FDA need to make such a recommendation? Congressman, we're still um, evaluating, at least from this season, some of the data relative to the high-dose vaccine um, and the vaccine with the adjuvant to see its relative effectiveness against H3N2. I mean, when we start to speculate around different theories around why the vaccine overall and vaccines historically might be uh, have been less efficacious against H3N2, one of the one of the the, the um, theories that you would put on a table certainly is uh, perhaps you might require a higher dose of antigen in order to have an adequate uh, immune response against H3N2. So it's something that we're going to need to consider among many other possibilities why around why historically we haven't seen a robust um, immune response from the uh, against H3N2 from vaccines generally uh, when we look back around around past seasons. The one thing we did observe so far this season was that the um, vaccine produced in cells, the cell-based vaccines, we had about 20 million doses produced in cells this year. Um, those do appear to be to have provided more protection on a relative basis of around 20 percent than the egg-based vaccines. And again, we aren't sure of the reasons why, um, but it does lead to some hypotheses around why maybe, generally speaking, um, we haven't seen as much uh, as robust response against H3N2 historically as we'd like. I know there are a number of new antivirals in the pipeline, including some that may treat the virus at the beginning of the life cycle. Dr. Bright, can you explain why these drugs differ from those currently on the market and how they might help us treat the flu in a new way? Absolutely. I think that's important to recognize. The one class of drug that we have that's effective on the market today is called a neuraminase inhibitor. It binds to an active pocket of a surface protein of the virus, and it really blocks the virus after it's already replicated from breaking away from an infected cell and going on to infect other cells. These new antiviral drugs are working on the replication cycle of the virus before it reproduces itself and buds away. It's so because they work at a different part of the virus life cycle, they also can be effective if the virus mutates and becomes resistant to the single class of drug that we have available on the market today. So it's critical that we have these different approaches to antiviral drugs. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I know I'm out of time and your courtesies. I have some other questions I'd like to submit if it's allowed. Uh, and, and thank our panel for being here today. It's, we're looking for that light at the end of the tunnel and uh and i just appreciate each of y'all partnering with each other to, um, to deal with it uh, obviously flu is terrible but you know there's a lot of other bugs out there that we'd like to deal with too thank you mr chairman the gentleman yields back and i will remind members that they do have 10 business days to submit questions for the record and i ask the witnesses uh, to agree to respond promptly should you get uh, additional questions in writing i want to thank you for your uh, time being here today it's uh, very informative, and uh, uh, Dr. Fauci, I enjoyed the, the slide presentation. I felt like I should get some college credit for that, <laughs> uh, to see that.
But to, to, to visualize that and see how it's better to attack the stem instead of the head and actually give you a, a good visual uh, was very informative. And, uh, you know, one day we'll, we'll be in here and we'll be discussing that effective uh, universal flu vaccine that we know we all uh, desire to see. And I was going to say I hope we continue to take steps, even if they're nanoparticle steps. Uh, to get uh, to that conclusion. But again, thanks uh, each of you uh, for being here. Uh, the subcommittee hearing is adjourned. Thanks. Thank you.